question on coral bleaching uh, looks innocuous, uh, looks like it's a routine question. But when you go to take a look at this question, that is, uh, discuss the concept of coral bleaching, its recovery and macroalgal regime shift due to this process, uh, then that is not going to be normal at all. This means it's a very, very specialized topic uh, and it is uh, not only specialized, uh, it's again, uh, like most of the topics they ask in the first paper, they happen to be super specialized and also they happen to be carrying a distinct, distinct tinge of being a scholarly in nature and also, of course, academic in nature as well. Now, picking up this topic, all in all, this question was asked largely because coral bleaching is a topic that is almost every time going to be in news. Uh, any type of temperature change, any type of a change that takes place in any of these uh, processes, uh, coral bleaching happens to be in news. Uh, the scope of this topic is that because uh, it goes on to be not only factual, it is factual, it is conceptual, it involves at least uh, some 16, 17 different type of terminologies. Uh, it's very, very mark switching as well. Of course, the approach is because it's a sort of scientific topic, it's a semi scientific topic. Uh, it is a uh, it is going to be not only uh, scientific, you can go to condense this topic, you can go to compact this topic. And this is again another topic, you can not only go to condense it and compact it, you can go on to make it look super compact with the use of a technical language. Although the students are likely to face a problem in putting up it in the form of a language, a language that is going to be so desired. But, the biggest problem is going to be how exactly is it that they can go to answer the second part. Because they may go to know the concept, but then to correlate it with the algal shift and the regime shift, that may go on to create some type of problem in this case. Of course, this is something that is as a source, it is not going to be found everywhere, and there are only specific places in portals where. The source is going to be existing, the source is going to be available as well. So that brings us to one of these first questions. What exactly is coral bleaching? Now I'll ex explain that to you in a different manner. Picking it up in a somewhat different way, you understand that part that is a corals are always going to be surrounded by what we're going to be calling it as a they are animals. They are animals that is called as a polyp and these corals, they go on to, they live in a cup shaped depression. This is where the corals go to live. Now this entire cup shaped depression, the outer part of it is going to be called by the name of a theca, epitheca, that's where animals live, that, that's the region and they're going to be having an outer shell which is going to be dominated by an algae called as dinoflagellate. It is a, this dinoflagellate, one of these dinoflagellates is going to be called by the name of zooxanthellae. That is the name that is going to be given to it, zooxanthellae. The word is, one word is xanthic. Xanthic means yellow. The word xanthic means yellow in color. And they are going to form a symbiotic relationship with the, with the dinoflagellates that we are going to be calling it by the name of zooxanthellae. So if anything happens to the corals which go on to live in this cup shaped depression, in this cup shaped depression, depression then corals go on to provide food to the dinoflagellates, the zooxanthellae. And the zooxanthellae, what they do is they provide protection to the corals. That's a symbiotic relationship and that is lost. When that is going to be lost, it is, a, it is this phenomenon that we are going to be calling it by the name of a coral bleaching because they are going to be yellowish in color. And the loss of this yellowish color is what is called as bleaching. And of course, the name is coral bleaching. Now, that is what I, this animation goes on to show to you. 
this animation shows it that you have coral cell. This is the place that you're going to find coral cell growing as well. This is the place where the coral is going to be find growing. That is the oral with the tentacle and the stinking cells that they're going to be having it. These are yellow in color and this yellowish color when it goes on to get lost and it is, it is going to be getting lost because of a variety of factors. So yellowish color goes on to become whitish in color, whitish and that is the name that is going to be given to coral bleaching. That is the general mechanism of it. Of course, it is going to be much more complicated than what we have essentially talked about in this case. But to understand this part eh, from a general perspective, this is what it is. Now, this coral bleaching takes place eh, because of a stress related bleaching. And a stress related bleaching can be induced if corals are subjected to a variety of factors like eh, intense solar radiation, that means especially ultraviolet wavelength eh, radiation, eh, reduction in marine salinity that is exposed to the air eh, and so on sedimentation or what we're going to be calling it is xenobiotics, eh? there is chemical contamination, eh? zoobiotics that is the attack of eh, some of these pathogens. Eh? Now often these conditions are at least eh, an indirect consequence of extremes in weather which may be produced. Eh? Uh, these extremes of weather can go on to be maybe hurricanes or typhoons eh? and which are responsible for causing an elevated sea surface temperature. So all in all, uh, multiple factors start acting in concert to cause such type of a bleaching. High solar radiance, particularly ultraviolet radiation, if it strikes it, is thought to be especially stressful in this case. And it is this, it is this uh, stressful uh, indication that is responsible for the bleaching of the corals. So if temperatures are going to be too hot and for too long, then the corals do go on to get destroyed. So if temperatures are too hot for too long, the symbiotic relationship eh, between the coral animal and the tenants that is the zook sanctuary that collapses. And when corals are stressed by high temperature and light, eh, some of the chemical reactions in photosynthesis breaks down. Parts of the zook sanctuary are damaged, that is the chloroplast where photosynthesis takes place and the result is that a large number of damaged zook xanthalae leave the corals. The corals are the corals are responsible for spitting them. They go on to ask them to go away because they are not able to provide food for them. Coral reefs are normally bathed in a high temperature. Rising water temperature blocked a photosynthetic reaction that converts carbon dioxide into sugar. That is a rising water temperatures block the photosynthetic reaction. So it is this photosynthetic reaction that is responsible for converting carbon dioxide into sugar that is the food. The result is built up of products that poison the zooxanthellae and to save itself the corals are responsible for spitting the zooxanthellae and some of its own tissue leaving the corals completely white. So it happens that coral reefs are bathed in unusually warm temperatures through at least two exclusive mechanisms. One is the doldrum condition, another is the current transportation. Now, doldrum condition is when, when the water is completely calm. When the water is going to be calm, then the sun says that it strikes the water, that heats up the water. Now, this water, unable to mix, keeps on raising its temperature and becomes inimical to the growth of the coral. That is condition one. How is it that high temperature can be reached? And second is current transportation. That means at any place from anywhere, if the currents go on to get themselves transported from one place to another place, if they go on to get themselves transported, then under such a condition, this transport of a warm current is responsible for again making the conditions for corals inimical and not very healthy and not very good for the growth of the corals. Corals again go to die under this condition as well. Then there is third cause that is increased exposure to ultraviolet radiation. Of course, ultraviolet radiation is going to be responsible for the killing of the corals. A large amount of storm water from heavy rains. Heavy rains are significant for killing the corals because 
corals are habituated to living in a very defined salinity condition. Heavy rains means that the salinity conditions have changed and that uh, there is a lot of fresh water available in that region. It is this fresh water that is responsible for killing the reef. And the exposure of uh, the corals uh, to certain type of chemicals or diseases, which is going to be called by the name of eozootics. Uh, that's the name that is going to be given to it. Uh. So introduction of uh, uh, new pathogens and thus new diseases, uh, for example, something like a band disease, black band disease, uh, these are the ones that are going to play the coral sediments eh? and uh, sand and dirt covering the corals. Eh? When there is going to be a good amount of sand and dirt that is covering it, eh? then that is responsible for again killing the corals. Eh? That is going to be called by the name of eozootics. Eh? The other is called as xenobiotics eh? and that is the chemical contamination of corals eh? by copper, herbicides eh? and oil as well in this case. Eh? Other than that. There can be excess nutrients such as ammonia and nitrates from fertilizers eh, and household products eh, entering the reef system. The nutrients eh, might increase the number of zooxanthellae in the coral. But then it is possible that the nutrient overload eh, increases the susceptibility of the coral to the diseases. Eh. And this is a distinct possibility. A good amount of eh, a nutrient eh, uh, is responsible for increasing the number of zooxanthellae. But then at the same time, it makes them weaker as well. And lastly, they go on to die because of what we call is sedimentation by the rivers. If sedimentation takes place, then that goes on to clog the mouth of the rivers, make the corals completely opaque and corals are not able to eat anything at all. Consequently, they die. All of this aspect of death is responsible for what we call, I call it as a coral bleaching. Now, once bleaching takes place, yeah, it is then that a macroalgal shift also takes place. Yeah. Now, understand what is macroalgae. Macroalgae is a collective term used for seaweeds and other benthic. Benthic means those that are going to be attached to the bottom. Benthic marine algae, it is an algae that are generally visible to the naked eye. It's not like microalgae, which is not visible to the naked eye. Large macroalgae are also referred to as seaweeds, although they are not really weeds of sorts. A phase shift, there is a, of course, this goes on to take place, and when we're going to be talking about macroalgae, they're going to form four different types of evolutionary lines, they're moving into different direction. And in conjunction with the cylindrate corals, that is, this is the name of the polyp, cylindrate corals, they are the primary producers and builders of a coral as well. So flashy microalgae can go on to outcompete these corals. These algae go on to fall in four, three categories, mainly blue green algae, green algae, brown algae and red algae. These are the different type of macroalgae that are going to be found to be associated with it and this is the type of picture that you go to see with respect to the coral cell. Now, the significance of uh, this uh, macroalgae is that, uh, as you say, uh, that is uh, a phase shift occurs in the coral reef uh, when the cover of a substrata by the sclerotine coral is reduced in favor of macroalgal dominance and resilience of the former condition is retarded. That means it goes on to get subsided because of an uh, ecological process and of environmental condition. We are talking about this algae is going to be there and they are the ones that are responsible for leading uh, to a lot of photosynthetic availability and any type of a shift away from that that is caused by the splitting of the zooxanthellae in this case. So phase shift occurs on the coral when the cover of a substrata by the sclerotinian coral that is the name of the polyp that is reduced and what exactly dominates that is the macroalgae dominates and the resilience of the former condition, that means resilience, that means they are resilient, that means they are able to withstand the condition, they are able to bear this condition. The resilience of the former condition gets reduced because of the ecological process or of environmental condition. That means they are no more resilient at all. The changes associated with the degradation of the corals, such as like that of coral bleaching, outbreaks of a coral eating species as well. That means some of these species are going to come and they are responsible for eating this as well. A storm damage as well. 
So all of these go on to involve a phase shift from abundant coral cell that goes on to bring about a change from abundant coral to that of a macro algae. Now, on many coastal reefs, the coral reefs face competition and overgrowth. And that is going to be taken place by fleshy macro algae. And what happens? First is due to acute disturbance events, this happens, that's number one. Second is that it can happen because of chronic nutrient enrichment, that is a, an enormous amount of a flow of a certain things like fertilizers, or it can be because of reduced herbivory. Now, reduced herbivory means uh, that is a uh, the number of herbivores are going to be reduced and there is no one to feed on that part at all. And then the degradation of the coral reefs involves a phase shift from abundant coral to that of abundant macro algae. That is where it takes place and active thereafter. Fleshy macro algae can outcompete corals, many of which are inhibited under elevated nutrient levels. Fast growing macroalgae are opportunists that benefit from disturbance and which release space resources from established long lived organisms. They can also go on to take over from living corals which provide them with sufficient amount of nutrients. That's what happens. But then we are going to be talking about macroalgae removal has received little formal attention as a method of what we call as reef restoration. That means in trying to restore reef, it has not been a very effective at all. And the effect of ecological role in a macroalgae and the coral reefs and the potential benefit and risk associated with the active removal is yet to be proved. That means we do not go to know that path at all. All in all, macroalgae go on to be not dominant in corals particularly when escleritian corals are going to be booming, they are healthy and they are growing. It is only when the zooxanthellae die, then this place of zooxanthellae, that is a dinoflagellates, is taking place by that of macroalgae. There is the blue algae, green algae, red algae, all of them. And then it is this macroalgae that goes on to dominate the whole of the zone wherever the coral living environment exists. To have more such discussions and analysis, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for notifications on our upcoming videos.